Good morning and welcome to Valley Forge Baptist Temple. It is Celebration Sunday. We are glad you're here. I love Sundays. I love Sundays. We're going to find out why we love Sundays so much. Uh, this is a time that we just take a moment to reflect back and think about God's great blessings on us in 2015. And we look forward to what he is going to do in us and through us in 2015. 16. This is my first time to talk in a week, so I'm glad to raise my voice in praise to the <laughs> King of Kings, Jesus Christ. Let's join together as we worship him in prayer. Father, thank you for this time to come into your house on your day and celebrate and to worship the King of all kings, our Savior. And I pray, Father, today that you will work in each of our hearts, uh, draw us closer to you, do a spiritual work that we might walk in the ways of God and shine the light of Jesus Christ to others. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you're visiting for the first time, just raise your hand for a moment. As the rushers come by, we'll pass one of our welcome booklets to you and ask you to fill the card out in just a moment.
shout something's wrong. <laughs> Let's all stand together as we start by singing number 477. Let's sing about that solid rock. <clears throat> we'll sing the first, second, and the fourth, 477 if you need it. Lift it up on the first. My hope is built on nothing. Ushers, if you could come forward now, we'll have the handouts uh, for this morning. We'll go ahead and sing, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine, the first and the third. If you don't have a handout, raise your hand as the ushers come by as we sing. Lift it up on the first. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. singing you may be seated amen thank you for singing out of your hearts this morning it's a great day to be in God's house now it's our privilege and joy to be able to give back to God just a portion of what he so wonderfully abundantly blesses us with so we're gonna ask our ushers to come forward be prepared to take that offering as they're coming forward I ask uh, brother Frank Robinson to give uh, the prayer for the offering today and thank God for his good hand upon us and uh, pray for Pastor Wendell's voice to continue to stay strong as we hear from the message from the Word of God and man's God today. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, it's a great joy to be in your house today, Lord, for we know that the Word of God will be proclaimed. Lord, I pray for each one here, Lord, that our hearts would be tender to your word. And, Father, where we need to change our lives, Lord, help us to change. Where, if there's a soul here, Lord, that's not sure of their eternal destination in heaven, Lord, help them to surrender their will today and receive Christ. We pray for Pastor that you'll give them a strong voice, Lord, and power with the word of God. We pray for that. We pray for our missionaries around the world, Lord, that we support that, uh, Lord, you'll bless them and keep them faithful in 2016. For, Lord, we know that this may be very well the year that you come back. Help us, Lord, to be prepared when you come back. In thy name we pray and ask it. Amen.
Sometimes my feet have wandered far away From boundaries that have always kept me safe Wherever I may go, Lord, it's good to know The love you have for me will never fade You love me so Today and more tomorrow, you, you always, always have. have, you always will. You love me still. At times, it's hard for me to comprehend the beauty of the grace I'm living in. No matter what I do. Whatever I go through, the love you have for me will never end. You love me still, and that is so amazing. You love me still, forever and unfailing. Wherever I go, your grace will follow. There's mercy today. Thank you for that beautiful song this morning. Our congratulations uh, to Branson and Amanda. They're expecting their third child, and so it'd be a great year for them. Well, we have an exciting year planned for 2016 at Valley Forge Baptist Temple, and today I want to give you an overview of some of the great things that God is working in my heart about, and I trust you will allow God to do the same work in your heart. Our theme for 2016 is Let God let God, let God have his way in your heart and life. He knows how to direct our lives so much better than we do. Well, how, how do we do that? How do we let God direct us? First of all, it is through the word of God. The more you know your Bible, the more you believe the Bible, the more you follow the Bible, the more you will experience a greater peace and power and joy and contentment uh, and you can experience that day by day and even hour by hour. Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And this is what God wants for you. The second way that he directs us is by his Holy Spirit. When you are filled with the Spirit and you're controlled by the Holy Spirit of God, God will prompt you in your conscience to do good things for God and for others. That is from him. And so if you want to experience the fullness of God in your life in 2016, you're going to have to let God. You're going to have to let God in. Let God lead you. Let God guide you. Let God forgive you. Let God cleanse you. And let God have his way in your life. You will not regret it. Uh, a few months ago, I, I shared a Sunday night illustration about letting God control our lives. And I had a couple of chairs set up here and and I brought up uh, Brother Panero and Pilot uh, Joe Springer. We sat there and told how at the mission conference last year, uh, Pilot Springer took us up, and uh, he let us fly the plane. Now, I'm not a pilot. I've never flown before, uh, but I had the controls and took off and flew, flew down here by the church and flew back and landed. And, and the whole time, the real pilot has his hands on the control. 
but I flew the plane. And then we switched, and Brother Panero, he got behind the wheel. Scary thing, let me tell you. Uh, uh, he, uh, uh, the pilot had a little more control over him because of the wind and the turbulence. And the reason the pilot had control was so we wouldn't crash the plane. And in that illustration, I said, God is my pilot. And one of you came up to me afterwards and you said, Pastor, you said it the right way. Because I've heard it so many times, I've seen it on the bumper sticker, God is my co-pilot. That's not true. God is the pilot. He is the one that is in charge. He is the one who we need to let uh, run and rule our life. He can be. You can let him in. So now, look at the graphic this year. I want you to see those, those dark clouds. That's life. Life's hard. Life can be black and white. Trials, sickness, death, pain, sorrow, anger, grudges, upset, consequences of sin. I mean, lots of bad things happen to us and, and, and those we know and love. But this is what happens when you let God be your pilot, when you let God take the controls. He brings color into your world. He, he brings joy. I want you to see the dark clouds, they're still there, but he is with you. He brightens your day. I mean, even the hard days, he brightens your days. Psalm 1611, thou wilt show me the path of life in thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. What a promise. And so I, I gave to our media guys clouds and let God, and this is what they gave us back. And I trust it'll thrill your heart all year long as you let God. Please open your Bibles with me this morning to Ephesians chapter 2. And we will see what happens when you let God take over your life. Ephesians chapter 2. There are four little epistles together. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. I have taught you an acrostic of how to find them. Do you know it? G-E-P-C. Gentiles eat pork chops. All right, you got it? G-E-P-C. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. Would you please stand with me as I read a portion of this incredible chapter as we let God have his way. Ephesians chapter 2. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, and the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past, in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who was rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. May we pray. Our Father, we thank you that you have moved into our lives and we give you praise. We desire to exalt you, to worship you, to love you, to serve you. We desire to show a lost, dark world your light. And so come into us and fill us and control us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. To let God take control simply means to, well, to give back to God that which already belongs to him, our lives. 
when we let go of our control and let God lead us, we let him set the agenda. We let him become the center of our heart. We pursue his missions. We devote ourselves to do his will. Look with me at what Jonathan Edwards wrote about surrendering his life to Christ. I claim no right to myself, no right to these affections that are in me. Neither do I have any right to do his bo do right to this body or its members, no right to this tongue, to these hands, feet, ears, or eyes. I have been to God this morning and told him I have given myself wholly to him. I claim no right to myself in any respect. I have expressly promised him, for by his grace I will not fail. His law is the constant rule of my obedience. I will fight with all my might against the world, the flesh, and the devil to the end of my life. I will adhere to the faith of the gospel, however hazardous and difficult the practice of it may be. No wonder God used this man to spark the revival we call the Great Awakening. But that's not how he started. He started out in his heart like all of us, rebels against God. And before Paul gives us the good news in the chapter, he presents to us the bad news. And so you must let God have your past. And in verse 1, we are told, you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. The word quickened means made alive. We were all born spiritually dead. We don't have fellowship with God until we are saved. We hear the word of God. We're convicted of sin. We trust Christ to become alive to God. You see, we're in a dark room spiritually with only a night light in the corner, the witness of creation, the witness of conscience. But once we're saved, God turns the light on. We're made alive in Christ. You were dead. You were unrighteous, is what he tells us in verse 2 and 3. He says, where in time past, you walked according to the course of of this world according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. That's Satan, among whom also we all had our conversation, our lifestyle in times past, in the lust of the flesh, the desires of the flesh, and of the mind. You were unrighteous. The Bible says that we were all born with a sin nature that is sinful. No parent ever taught their children how to lie, how to steal, how to cheat. I mean, it's already in their heart. Our hearts are spiritually dark. Listen to how one Bible commentator summarized uh, the condition of our soul in these first three verses. It wasn't so long ago that you were stuck in that old godless life of sin. You let the world, which doesn't know the first thing about living, tell you how to live your life. You filled your mind with polluted unbelief and then blindly lived in disobedience. We all did it. We did what we felt like doing when we felt like doing it. It's a wonder God's patience didn't run out and just give us what we really deserve. Two weeks ago, on our way back home from my parents in Virginia, Jody and I listened to an incredible testimony of a man who experienced Ephesians 2 in a dramatic way. His name is Christopher Huan. He and his mother, Angela, have co-authored a book called Out of a Far Country. It is a modern prodigal son story. Christopher is the son of Chinese immigrants. Though born in America, his parents wanted him to keep his Chinese heritage. But he just didn't fit in. He, he said, I was shorter, I wore glasses, I was picked on because I was a little more effeminate and artistic. When he was nine years old, Christopher saw pornography at a friend's house for the first time. That's when he started thinking he may be a little different. He said, those images just awoke something in me that I didn't know was there. But I also noticed that I was attracted to the images of both the men and the women. He kept his secret until he was 20 when he started going to gay bars. Raised in an affluent home in Chicago, he went on to dental school. He finally told his parents of his gay lifestyle, and they were, they were devastated. 
And that mom and dad decided to pray for their son intently. He was a dental student by day, but by night he became enslaved by a lifestyle ruled by homosexuality and drug abuse. Four months before his graduation from dental school, from becoming a doctor, he had been selling drugs and he was expelled from his school. His parents prayed and surprising a surprising answer came. He said, there was a knock at my door. I opened it up, and it wasn't anybody that I'd seen before. It was 12 federal drug enforcement agents. I was caught with the equivalent of nine tons of marijuana. If you will let God in your life, if you will let God have your past, then you will understand, let her see, you were deserving of wrath. You were deserving of wrath. This last week, I, like many of you, slowly read Genesis 19, and it records one of the darkest days in the history of mankind, culminating with the divine and cataclysmic judgment of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. But 2 Peter 3.10 tells us that one day the entire world will receive the same fate, destruction by fire. Every country in the world has courts and judges and prisons. The earthly courts should be a reminder that we will all one day stand in a heavenly court. And the similarities are, are, are striking. A judge, a criminal, evidence, a verdict, a sentence. For the Christian, thank God there is a defense attorney, Jesus Christ, the righteous who already paid our penalty. But for the unbelievers, they will stand in that heavenly courtroom. God will be their judge. The great white throne is recorded in Revelation 20, 11 to 15. You don't want to appear before God as your judge. You want to receive him as your savior now. Well, how can you let God have your past? By letting God have your present. Let God have your present. And so we pick it up in verse 4. But God... But God, the first two words of verse 4 serve as a springboard for the good news. But God, these two words stand between the grim picture of sin, death, and judgment to come and the hope of salvation through Jesus Christ. But God, God is the initiator. God is the author. God is the planner of our salvation. I mean, it's all his idea. By grace are you saved. And the first quality mentioned in verse 4, look what he says. But God who is rich in mercy. Mercy is the opposite of divine wrath. Paul said in Ephesians 1, 7, in whom we, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. The definition of mercy is having withheld that which is deserved. We deserve God's wrath and the lake of fire, but God... But because of his great love, he has forgiven us. Because of his grace, the chains of the old life are broken and our past has been pardoned. When King Frederick II, Frederick the Great, the 18th century king of Prussia, was visiting a prison in Berlin, the inmates tried to prove to him why they were unjustly imprisoned, all except one. He just kind of sat quietly over in the corner while all the rest claim their innocence. The king went to the quiet one in the corner and asked him what he was there for. Armed robbery, your honor. The king asked, were you guilty? Yes, sir. I entirely deserve my punishment. Then the king gave this order to the guard. Release the guilty man. Release the guilty man. You see, like the prisoner, you and I were imprisoned to sin. We were spiritually dead. We had no hope of saving ourselves. We cannot forgive ourselves. Only God can forgive us. Only God can pardon us. And like this king, pardon that prisoner. So when you commit your life to Jesus Christ, the king of heaven will issue a pardon for your soul. Did this man do anything to deserve mercy? No. And this is what we read in verse 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And yes, 
This is the same king of Prussia for whom the inn uh, and the town is named after eight and a half miles down the road. Now, when I moved here, I was told that the king of Prussia visited the inn, and that's why they named the town after him. Not true. Uh, it was called the, uh, the Berries Inn, and then we have a document that says in 1786 it was renamed the King of Prussia Inn in honor of the king's support of George Washington. It probably attracted some Prussian soldiers as well with a name like that. Uh, George Washington visited the inn on Thanksgiving Day, 1777, right before he brought his army to Valley Forge for the winter. And now you know the rest of the story about the king of Prussia. Now let me let Christopher Huan tell his Let God story. It was shock because I did not oh, think... Hold on just a second. As he was heard on Family Life Today last month, close to graduation from dentistry school, but his life was immersed in drugs and homosexuality until the day that he was arrested. Now listen to how God arrested his attention. It was shock because I did not think I was going to get caught. I thought that I was invincible, no one was ever going to touch me. So when I finally got arrested, it was unbelief. I couldn't believe that this was it. And it was a few days after I was incarcerated and I was walking around the cell block. I passed by a garbage can and it was just, just filth coming out of it. And I thought, that's my life, trash. And I was about to walk by that trash can. And yet I saw something on top of that trash. And I picked it up, and it was a Gideon's New Testament. Hmm. And I took it back to my cell, and I opened up that good book. And for the first time, I read through the entire Gospel of Mark that night. But I did not think that this was going to be the answer to all my problems. But as we know, what we have in our Bibles is not ink on paper, mm -hmm. but it's the breath <laughs> of God. Yeah. And it is sharper than any double-edged sword, and it cut through my hard, hard heart. Was this all new to you? Uh, had, had you heard the story of Jesus at all? You know, I, I probably had heard about this man, Jesus, but I didn't know what it all meant. I just figured he was some man, some good person. But I didn't know that he was Lord. I didn't know that he was Savior, and I didn't know he was God. You eventually uh, went to court and were sentenced? Yes. I was uh, sentenced to six years. I really thought I was going to get a slap on the hand, get out, because I'm a good kid from upper middle class suburb of Chicago, my father's a dentist. I'm actually, you know, I'm a good person. I'm not a high school dropout. I don't live on the streets. Well, I got some even worse news. For all inmates that come through the system, the federal system, they all have to get a physical. So um, went through the physical, got blood tests. And a week after that, I was called back to the hospital. I sat there in the nurse's office. She was all nervous. It was just uncomfortably struggling with the word. So she wrote something on a piece of paper and she slowly slid it across the desk to me. And on the piece of paper, I saw three letters and a symbol. And it read H I V positive. The chaplain in the jail uh, gave you a book. Yes, yeah. That, yeah. Uh, that affirmed your lifestyle, right? That, that said being a gay Christian, there's nothing wrong with that, yeah. right? Yeah, I shared with this chaplain, and he uh, told me, hey, you know, th the Bible doesn't condemn homosexuality. And he gave me a book uh, from his bookshelf, uh, which explained that view, and I was 
very curious. I thought, wow, okay, so I can have my cake and eat it too. I can have both. I can be a Christian. I can continue affirming homosexual relationships, pursuing homosexual relationships, and there's nothing wrong with that. God would bless that. So I took this book in the hopes of finding biblical justification for homosexuality. But as I read it, I had that book in one hand and the Bible in the other. And as I was reading that book and as it was going over the different passages in Scripture and and justifying and saying how it didn't condemn it, I would go to the Bible and I would read the entire paragraph or the entire chapter or that whole book that it was talking about. And I believe it was a true miracle of God that it was the Holy Spirit that indwells within us that convicted me that this was not only a distortion of God, but it was a distortion of his word. So I couldn't even finish that book, and I gave it to the chaplain. Mm. And I just read through the Bible. I went through every verse, every chapter, every page of scripture, looking for anything to justify, to have a positive, uh, to bless homosexual relationships, monogamous adult consensual homosexual relationships. But I couldn't find anything. Yeah, and, and I like the way you you write about this in the book because you say you began to see that heterosexuality is not the opposite of homosexuality. There's a passage that we see uh, three times, you know, once in the old, twice in the new, where it says, be holy for I am holy. I realized that God wasn't saying be heterosexual for I'm heterosexual, but he didn't say be homosexual for I'm homosexual either. I mean, because what does heterosexuality mean? It means being attracted to the opposite sex, which then could condone adultery, fornication, lust, all these things. And Mm -hmm. so I thought even if I became straight, I would still need to submit my life, my thoughts, my passions to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So I thought, Even if somehow there was this shift from going from gay to straight, I would still need to pursue holiness. And so that's why I realized that the opposite of homosexuality is not heterosexuality. That shouldn't be my goal, but the opposite of homosexuality is holiness. That I needed to pursue holiness. We all need to pursue holiness. Mm -hmm. It does not matter what your proclivities are. God has called us to live a life of holiness, not on our own strength, but through the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning of me realizing that this is what God is calling me to, not to focus upon my orientation, as the world would call it, not focusing upon what are my temptations, but focusing upon living a life of purity and holiness, regardless of whether these temptations and struggles go away or not. God has done a wonderful work in Christopher's life, Ephesians chapter 2 illustration, and in his mother and father's lives as well. Upon his release from prison, Christopher enrolled in Moody Bible Institute where he is now a professor. In the next slide, I think you can see that. From prisoner to professor, from prisoner to Bible college professor, that is the power of God from finding a New Testament in a trash can. That's the power of God to bring this man salvation, to bring him from the darkness of what Ephesians 2, verses 1 to 3 says. You can go to his website, ChristopherYawn.com. For those who have family members, friends, co-workers that are homosexual, the question and answer session on his website is about the best that you will ever find. Speaking as a former homosexual, speaking as a new Christian, he shares love and grace and mercy, but he answers their questions. He uses scientific articles to debunk the gay gene myth. He cites studies about identical twins. Only 6% of identical twins were both gay. If they were born with a gay gene and they are exactly identical in their DNA, then a gay twin would also have to be gay, right? 
not true 94% of the time. It's like saying, well, I was born with an adultery gene, or I was born with a liar gene, or I was born with an idolater gene. We all have that. We're all born with a sin nature. We have a sin gene. It's in our nature. And that's why we need to let God have our present. By grace are you saved. But the second thing he says here is, by grace are you raised. Look in verse 6. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. God not only saved us, but he raised us from, the de from death to life and seated us with Christ. The term seated means to be enthroned. This is only made possible if Jesus Christ is alive. And he is alive because he said, because I live, ye shall live also, John 14, 19. This means forever and forever. We are to be aware. We are to live in a spiritual dimension. We are connected to heaven. Heaven is really our home. And we are really going to live there forever. And you need to view your life like an ambassador in a foreign country. The ambassador lives in the foreign country possibly for years, but their citizenship is back home. We are on earth for just a short time. And then our king will call us back home to heaven. Let God have your past. Let God have your present. And that brings us to point three. Let God have your future. Let God have your future. Notice in verse 7, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Our salvation be benefits us forever. Oh, yes, we rejoice in that, that our salvation benefits us forever. We will experience God's grace forever. But notice, our salvation glorifies God forever. That verse begins, that in the ages to come, forever and forever, he might show the angels and the people and the demons the exceeding riches of his grace. Our very presence in heaven for eternity says something about God. You being in heaven forever says, God is good. You being in heaven forever says, God is merciful. You being in heaven forever says, God loves you. This is what salvation does. It glorifies God forever. And then thirdly, our salvation inspires good works for now. Verse 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus and two good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. The primary purpose of God saving us is not simply to take us to heaven, but that we should have fellowship with God that we should be holy. John Milton created the classic book, Paradise Lost, but Jesus Christ created the classic, you and I, Paradise Regained. When God saved you, he remade you, and his Holy Spirit lives inside of you. Your conscience now has a light on God's light, and for the first time, the Bible begins to make sense. You understand the big questions of life. You see it in there in your notes. Where did I come from? Where am I going? Why am I here? From verse 8 to 10, we see exactly what we saw last week. Two sides of the riverbank. The responsibility of man, and the sovereignty of God, and the river of salvation flowing in the middle. And it's true not just in salvation that, that I have a responsibility, and God has his part, but it's true in our daily Christian life. It is God who works in us. But notice in verse 10, he says, We are created in Christ Jesus unto good works. We have a responsibility to do good works, not to save our soul, but to demonstrate, to show God to others. What are you living for? What are you living for? You know, a lot of things I do is because I'm thinking about my future. I'm thinking about the time that I will stand before God. What I do today, how I spend my money and my time, my words, my attitude, will it bring reward or will it bring regret? If someone were to hand you $1,000 today, how will you spend it? How will you use it? How will you give it? How will you invest it? How will you feel about that extra bonus $1,000 when you stand before the Lord and give an account for what you did with that extra money? I'd like you to use your imagination this morning. And so...
What I have here is a rope that is going to represent something. I'm going to have to ask some help here. But this rope, if, if you could imagine that this rope represents a timeline and that it's a little longer than 50 feet, but that it actually goes across the entire state of Pennsylvania. Using your imagination, can you imagine that this rope will go all the way across the country, all the way across the world, to the moon, all the way, all the way across our solar system, all the way across the universe? This rope represents the timeline of your existence. You see, when God, when God made you and created you a living soul, he created you a living soul that will live somewhere forever and ever. Now in this, this timeline of, of your existence, I want you to let the three inches of red represent your time here on earth. It's not very long, is it? You see the red part? The few short years you have here? And then, and then you've got eternity somewhere, your existence. What blows me away is that, that, that all of you think about this red part. I mean, some of you, that's all you think about. Uh, you, 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 can't, you can't wait. Where, where are you on the red part right now? You about halfway? Remember that chart last week? We showed you how much time you have left. Uh, some of you, all you think about is this last little bit right here. And then you want to save, save, save because you're so worried about this last little bit you call retirement. Will I be able to travel? Will I be able to have enough food to eat? Will I be able to pay my school taxes? And you're so consumed with the little tiny bit of the red at the end. The Apostle Paul says, I I'm going to live for the mission. I'm going to spend my life, I'm going to invest my life, not, not for this moment, but I'm going to, to spend my life, I'm going to make my decisions based on all of this other existence of millions and millions of years. Look what he says again in verse 7. He says that in the ages to come, the millions and millions of years of eternity. Why would I spend, why would I spend my life just focusing on this little red portion of my existence? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense if I really believe that I'm going to live forever and ever, and what I do in this little portion is going to affect the rest of my existence for eternity. You know, people, people write things, and they've said to me, well, it's just foolish the way you live. It's foolish the way you spend your money. And I say, because what I do might disaffect my comfort level in this little red portion. I say, it's foolish for you to spend all your time on this little portion and forget about all of that. It's going to go on forever and ever. You think I'm crazy. I think you're crazy. We need to give some thought to all of eternity, not just the little portion of this time that we have here on earth. The Apostle Paul said, I'm not going to get distracted. I'm not going to get sidetracked. I, I know it's tempting for all of us. It's tempting to be able to just be, be focused on this part. And, and then there's those addictions of drugs and, and alcohol and immorality and dishonesty and cheating and stealing and even pursuing things that are not illegal but simply just a big waste of time. It seems that the whole world is living for the red part. Did you, did you, see, did you see the lines of the lottery this week? I, I, we were in Wawa with my kids. My wife wanted a Dunkin' Donut coffee, and so we stopped at Wawa because we do Wawa, not Dunkin' Donuts. And, and so I had my kids in there, and, and, and we all got a little drink, and I, I brought them over, and all these people lined up, and I said, come here, kids, look. Do you see all the idolaters? <laughs> do you see all the idolaters? Because they're, they're living for this. I didn't spend any money in the lottery ticket last night. 
because I'm not living for this. Living for, for all of this. This is what makes sense. It's crazy, it makes no sense. You spend all of your life and your time to be comfortable for this little portion and you ignore all of eternity. That in the ages to come, we want to show forth his praise and his glory. I'm not going to let my past hold me down. I'm not going to let my past chain me. Paul said, I'm pressing toward the mark. I'm straining with every exertion and muscle in my body. I'm not going to look at the things on the side to distract me. I'm focused on the mark, the, the, the prize of Jesus Christ. I want to be thinking at that time, I want to cross the finish line. I want him to be able to hand me a trophy I want to be able to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. But I gotta be thinking about, I gotta be thinking about eternity. I gotta set my affection on things above. And you could take this, this is true in any area of life. Young, young couples that are getting ready to marry. Are, they, are you gonna be thinking about just today? Are you gonna be thinking about tomorrow? How about the, 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 the children who say, oh, you know, I want to open my presents before Christmas Day, and, and then they do, and then they're so disappointed on Christmas morning. It's spoiled. There's a time to wait and a time to be disciplined and a time to postpone because something better is coming. It's eternity. It's beyond our wildest expectations and dream of what God has planned for us. This world as we know it is not going to be like this forever. It's passing away. God has prepared such a wonderful place in heaven that when we see him, we'll not be thinking about, about the things of this life. You'll not be thinking about the car you drove and the house you lived in, not even your family, because God is going to exchange your family for a bigger family, a family of God. What a day it will be. What a day it will be. Let God, let God have his way in your life this year. Now, most people here today think you're going to heaven. And my prayer is that all of us will go to heaven. But remember this. A person may go to heaven without wealth, without beauty, without learning, without fame, without friends, but no one can go to heaven without knowing Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. You've got to let God in. You've got to say yes. You've got to do your part. God has done his part. His son has died. His son has risen again. The spirit is knocking and convicting. Let God, let God in. May we pray. Father, thank you for the wonderful truth of the Word of God. Thank you for the wonderful truth of our Savior who died upon the cross, who rose again and offers the gift of salvation. Thank you for your rich mercy, your kindness towards each one of us. And Father, today we pause to say we do want to let you in. We do want to let you have your way and your will in our lives in 2016 and beyond. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. You'd say, Pastor, if I die today, my salvation is secure. There was a time in my life that I made a personal commitment to receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I have the peace, I have the assurance, I have the confidence from God that I am born again. Would you raise your hand if you are not ashamed of the Savior to say, I am saved all over the congregation? Thank you. You may put your hands down. You say, Pastor, I think I'm saved. I hope I'm saved, but I'm not sure. God offers a gift to you today, his gift of eternal life. Would you like to receive it? Do you sense the Spirit of God tapping at your heart's door? The lifeline has been thrown out to you. Simply receive him, to believe that he died for you and rose again. You'd say, yes, I want to do that right now. I want to call upon the name of the Lord. Would you raise your hand that I may lead you in the salvation prayer? I've never done this. I've never made this kind of commitment to think about eternity, to think about my soul. But today I want to be saved. Anyone at all, would you raise your hand? God bless you. Anyone else, I would like to pray with you today. 
join me right now where you're seated. From your heart, you can pray sincerely. God will hear even the silent prayer of your heart. Pray with me now, dear Lord. I know that I am a sinner. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sin. I believe Jesus died for me and rose again. Please come into my heart and become my Lord and Savior. I trust Jesus Christ and him alone to save my soul. Christian, may I ask you, has your focus only been on the three inches of red on that timeline of eternity? Will you let God into your life in 2016? Will you let God have his way? And you know in your heart right now, you've not been going God's way. You've been so consumed with the here and now, and you've left God out of your thoughts, out of your plans, your time, your money, your treasure, your energy. But you want 2016 to be different. You want that color and joy of God to come into your life on a daily basis. Would you simply raise your hand and say, I dedicate 2016 to God all over. God bless you. God bless you. I give the year to God. Father, may you bless in this invitation time. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. May we stand together. We'll sing a song of invitation as we sing 167, Just As I Am, Without One Plea. If you want to be able to come to the altar, if you want to speak to a pastor, pastor's wife, step out as we sing on the first verse of the invitation. It is a public invitation. Let God have his way in your life now. May 2016 be a year that we again and again we see God working in our lives. You may be seated for just a moment. The ushers are going to be coming with an overview of what will be happening uh, by way of pulpit ministry and other events here in 2016. And while we do that, uh, we have a new course that we'd like to be able to introduce to you, uh, Let God Arise. And so what I'd like to do is, is to be able to let Josh sing it once be able to teach it to us, and then we'll sing it together. Thank you, Josh. We're going to finish up for uh, 2 Corinthians in the next uh, three weeks. Now, if you take your booklets, you can go ahead and open it up. 
And uh, then we'll be starting a series called I Love Sundays. I Love Sundays. Uh, Sundays can surprise you. Good Sundays make better Mondays. Better Sundays make better families. And then Sundays can change your eternity and how Sundays have changed the world. By then, we'll be into Palm Sunday and uh, Easter Sunday. We look forward to that. And then, following that, we'll be having the Let God theme messages come to us. I look forward to that already. Uh, let God have your heart. Let God have your past, your future, your marriage, your children, on Mother's Day, your schedule, your talents. Uh, let God uh, have your time and your money. And then we'll be at I Love America Sunday and let God have your fear and your character and your thoughts. Then we're going to... Uh, we have our missions conference there in the spring uh, as well. We look forward to that time. We have uh, Brother Jeremy Panero and Brother Phil Lian. God has wonderfully used these men uh, there in the uh, Far East and South Pacific, and that will be a tremendous blessing. So what you do is you, you go to your calendar, and you, you already see it blocked off. If you don't have a church calendar, uh, we have some up in the balconies and the usher stations. Let's make sure. Uh, in fact, let's go ahead and bring them now. So ushers, if you have calendars, you go ahead and bring them. We have extras. We don't want these calendars sitting in a pile here. So if you would like a second calendar, maybe for your workplace uh, or uh, you have a second office at home, uh, go ahead and raise your hand and the ushers can bring you one of those calendars. But you'll see it. Uh, people say to me every April, oh, I can't believe it's Mission Conference. I didn't know it was here. And well, yes, you do. Uh, we told you, we gave you a calendar. And, and so you want to be a part of that time. And then summertime vacation, Bible school, uh, Cowabunga Farm. Kids are going to love this time. Uh, again, Jeremy Panera will be here. It's great with the kids. The Amazing Race at the same time as our Teen Week. Look forward to that. And, and then as we get in towards the uh, end of the summer, thinking God's thoughts. If you want to let God really be in your life, then, then open your heart and your mind to Philippians 4.8. Uh, four things I wish I knew about God will be coming into the fall. And then let go. Let go and let God. And uh, I believe it would be a great help to your heart. That puts us into the Asian Pastors Conference there in November 2nd to 6th. Going to be a great year. God is already at work. And, and let me just share that with you. Uh, the last uh, uh, two Monday nights, God has been at work. Good news from the Monday night basketball outreach. Uh, Pastor Reifer wrote me, it's a wonderful way to end the old year, begin the new one. Monday, December 27, Keith Lyman had his first opportunity to speak to the men. He shared his testimony of salvation and gave a gospel presentation. And at the end of the devotional, there were seven to eight first-time visitors there that night. And praise the Lord, seven men raised their hand for salvation. This past Monday, Pastor Reifert had the privilege of sharing the gospel around the theme of cleaning up your act in the new year. Two men raised their hand for salvation and prayed with him to receive Christ. Uh, Pastor Driver writes, what a joy to see fruit from this simple ministry of allowing a few men to throw a round ball through a basket and scoring big in life with their salvation. To score salvation, so to speak, makes three-pointers seem worthless in comparison. Hope this helps make your day brighter. And it certainly does. God is at work here at Valley Forge Baptist Temple. If you have a bulletin, you can pull it out. See the events here of the week evening service tonight at 6 o'clock. Brother Dave Davis is going to be doing a three-week series on music. Uh, you don't want to be able to miss it starting tonight uh, for three Sunday nights in a row. Parents, if you have uh, teenagers, they need to be out to be able to hear such an impactful uh, series as the next three Sunday nights. Uh, and then the events of the week, Master Club Wednesday, evangelism training. Uh, Brother Rick Schneider uh, has begun a new Wednesday night series on the life of Abraham. If you were not here Wednesday, you want to go to the archive, listen to it. Uh, great introduction. God will speak to your hearts in a mighty way on Wednesday nights, but you have to be able to hear the Word of God. Friday is a ladies' prayer time. Uh, Saturday school, the Bible begins in the library with Pastor Elstock teaching on Bible, geography, and customs. It'll just open up uh, your understanding of the Bible uh, to be able to be through that series. Winter Outreach, 10 o'clock on Saturday. Appreciate all those who came yesterday, had a part in our Share Joy uh, uh, Outreach yesterday. 
connection card. I believe there's a couple things there. Uh, Chosen 300 uh, is the ministry to the homeless and needy in Pottstown. And if you'd like to help out in the grocery shopping, I think one person has signed up, not even a member, uh, said they'd like to be a part of that. If you'd like to do that, that would be, that would be terrific. And then the triple bundle of blessings shower next Sunday night at 5.30 in the lobby for Amanda Lardy uh, with her baby girl. Eileen Joyner with a baby boy and Kate Lepore with a baby boy. Uh, two of these three are staff members and Lou and Kate have, uh, uh, God has brought them through uh, the, uh, the, the darkness of those clouds and to let God come in and give them uh, their uh, little uh, baby boy. And so you want to be a blessing to them with cards and gifts next Sunday night. Uh, we'll also have the uh, annual church business meeting. And that'll be next Sunday night at 5 o'clock. And then... Uh, we are looking for you to be able to make recommendations to our deacons uh, for two new deacons. Uh, deacons have a role from Acts chapter 6. Their qualifications are found in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, they are official servants. We are all to be servants, but you can read that. Like uh, any of our deacons that are here right now, if you would stand, any of our deacons that are here, if they would stand up, and you can go to any of our deacons and make a recommendation of deacons, of men that you think would be good deacons. Uh, these are, are, are men that uh, will be involved in the ministry of uh, the, the three roles we find in Acts 6 are that they, they help uh, the uh, pastors in the work of the ministry. They put down grumbling and complaining, and they take care of widows. And so this is what deacons do, and uh, they have additional duties here of, of doing lockup, business meetings, other things, uh, but we have a need for two more and uh, with one in disability and one in heaven. And so please, you pray about that, and in the next week you can uh, make those recommendations directly to the deacons, and we'll begin that process. Teen Winter Retreat is, is uh, sign up is due today, and the youth ministry has a need for 10 scholarships in the amount of $150 for the winter retreat uh, for some of our bus kids and some in the church that would not be able to attend. The second need is prayer for snow. Okay, so uh, uh, those are the two things. Money and snow will really make this thing work out great. And so uh, if you are so inclined and would like to be able to help a teenager who could not go, it's a two-night uh, uh, overnight retreat. There's a guest speaker coming in. Uh, they uh, also have a lot of fun. And so if there's a need for 10, I thought we'd at least offer to split it five and five. If there are five folks, you'd say, I'd give $150 to send a teenager to a winter retreat. Would you just raise your hand for a moment? We got our five. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, we got six. Seven. Thank you so much. We'll get the balance of the three in the, uh, in the next service. Uh, may God richly bless you for uh, your love for the teens and your generosity. Well, let's all stand together and... Uh, We'll be dismissed in just a moment. See if I have forgot anything else. <laughs> rugby ministry opportunity. Uh, we invite rugby teams to come and practice in the wintertime in our Family Life Center. And if you would like to be, men, if you'd like to come and unlock the door at 545 and be here at 1015, you'd have opportunity to present the gospel twice, just a short gospel presentation, about uh, seven minutes long. Uh, and if you are able to do, it's a 10-week period, it'll rotate Tuesdays and Thursdays. If you can do one or two, sign up on the connection card, and we will go ahead and uh, get you in that schedule. And then also to be able to pray for uh, Lisa, uh, Lopez with the loss of her uh, stepfather, Danny Dare. Uh, the funeral service will be Friday night. Pastor Colton will be officiating at the uh, Catagnus Funeral Home at 7.30 in Royersford. Also, uh, Pastor Colton and I shared a funeral yesterday for uh, a young man who had passed away, uh, Troy uh, Larson. His parents attend here and uh, four responded to uh, Pastor Colson, Colton's gospel presentation to receive Christ as Savior. You know that little, that little red section on the rope? Uh, that man, it was about half of what you think. He had about 40 years. We have no promise on tomorrow. That's why we want to let God in today and let God do a mighty work in our lives. Let's ask Brother Rick Schneider to come and to lead us in word of closing prayer. Okay, if I can take this moment just to have one more announcement. You'll see it on the screen, on the slides every, uh, as they're going through before the service. 
but the uh, sportsman's banquet, we have this every other year, and this is our year to have it. It'll be the first Saturday in March. So these will be out on the information desk if you'd like to hand it out an invitation. Uh, Chad Shearer, who was our speaker two years ago, who will be coming in again, and you remember, the ladies, you remember his wife, Marsha, she'll be here also, and, and the boys, and, and uh, two years ago, God really showed himself strong, and I believe we had 30 to 33 people profess to know the Lord as their personal savior that night. So this is a ministry outreach. Yeah, we get to tell hunting stories and lies, but it's really <laughs> about sharing the gospel with Jesus Christ. And so uh, you can pick these up and invite your friends, hunters, fishermen, uh, but uh, ultimately we're fishing for souls. So let's pray. Father, again, Lord, I thank you for your goodness today. Thank you for the wonderful message that we heard this morning, Lord, that, that you are so good to us. But God, you changed the course of our history when we saw your, our need for your son, for our savior. Thank you for that. Thank you for the privilege that we have to serve you. I ask, Lord, that you continue to, to bless our time together this morning, Lord, as we go to our next classes or the next service, Lord. I ask that you continue to help everything that we do and everything that we say bring glory to Jesus Christ. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.